Okay, then we can start. So welcome to the open, open land map session. We have uh, 90 minutes, maybe a bit less. We can finish early at the end of the day. Um, and so I'm going to talk about open land map and I'll be opening my, uh, some maps on my laptop and um, I will be showing you some things and interacting. Uh, let me just start with, uh, just to see like who uses open land map so far? Who uses it? Did you use it for any purpose? Okay, great. So it looks like you all knew. Uh, so I will show you some things on open land map. I will show you how you can use it. Uh, and it is uh, largely, it's a work in progress. Although, I mean, we have something like, I think like um, eight terabyte of data on open land map, but it's largely work on progress. And we're just doing a major upgrade um, so we will upgrade to uh, almost up to 100 terabyte of data. Um, so that's going to be a, a big um, upgrade. And I just want to say that I share my slides on the Mattermost. So if you see something, some URL or something, uh, you don't have to uh, take pictures or anything. It's all on Mattermost. Uh, I, I developed this, um, uh, for me, this open land map is very important. We started with it about four years ago, and um, it's really uh, a flagship flagship system of Open Geohub. And uh, it is, the name, you know, it's kind of resembles the open street map. So th there is this idea of developing a community and making a, a world maps. Uh, it's just open land map is focused on environmental data. So we're not, we don't compete with open street map, you know, there's zero overlap. So we do really different and we use open, open street map data. And just to say this, this is some of the slides that were made by me, but they were also made by my colleagues, Leander and Yufong, and also by Murat, uh, just to mention that. Uh, so open land map, so it's uh, obviously it's a, a global uh, data system. Uh, and at the moment we have um, maps of different resolution. And uh, we have kind of multiple components of the system. Of course, one component is the data, the layers. Uh, then the other component is the back end, how the layers organize. Then there's the, there's the API and the front end. Uh, and then there's all the documentation and things. So there are different components. Um, and uh, OpenGeoHub kind of makes the data. We make more or less most of the data set. Uh, but we get a lot of help from GitLab. They are with us an open net monitor. Uh, and they uh, do a lot uh, the back end and front end, especially Luca Glushica and uh, Ognjen uh, Antonievich. They do a lot of. Um, a back-end, front-end, and also Sergeant Popovich. So that's kind of the people behind it, just to give you an idea. Uh, we just moved to open uh, to GitHub, so we, we will post all this uh, code and documentation here. At the moment, there's three repos. One is uh, the spatial layers, how the layers are made. Then there's a book, open land map, and, and uh, there's the point data sets, how they're made. The book looks like this, it's just a Git book. Um, it has to be updated, but uh, it will have description of all functionality, how to use things. Uh, also, it will review uh, big uh, data sets, etc. Uh, to skip immediately to open land map. So if you land an open land map, the one of the first things you see it's land cover. And we are proud that we put uh, in open land map, we put uh, three reference data sets. We are interested primarily in the time series land cover. So we don't have the 10 meter resolution, the new 10 meter resolution land cover, but we do have the, this is the uh, European Space Agency, CCI. So we are somewhere, um, we're somewhere here, right? Uh, so I can zoom in and I can look, this is the Bolzano and we can, we can play a little story of this place. We can see how this city grew uh, if you go before 2000, I see there's a difference in the size of the city. And then you see how it grows. So you can play this little animation uh, to see all the, the changes. It's not the perfect data set. Um, there is the, the 100 meter resolution data set also. Um, so let's see this one. 
This is the 100 meter resolution. I think it's made by, you see the drastic difference in the uh, level of detail, but the 100 meter is unfortunately only available to 2015. So you cannot see what happens before that. And you don't really don't see much changes, right? It's really just a few pixels are changing. Um, then there is also the Hilda data set. This is a one kilometer, see drastic change. Uh, but this one, we can go all the way to 60, 1960, right? So if you want to see uh, how this area changed, um, going back to 1960, it's also possible. Uh, of course, maybe Europe is not so interesting to look at the uh, land cover changes. If I move maybe to Brazil, uh, so let's go somewhere here. Uh, this, this gets much more interesting that you can display these drastic changes and how the, um, especially the tropical forest has been converted into agricultural land and pasture land, etc. So, so, and so you can play this video and what's nice about this, uh, you see it's very fast, it's running on geo-server and steroids and we put all the data at, on SSD, all the data we want to go fast. So it's really fast. I mean, you can really animate. And what's nice about uh, Open Land Map also, you you have this URL bookmarking system. So uh, if you look at it uh, here, uh, let's see. So here's the bookmarking system. So I have the base layer, I have the center, zoom level, opacity, layer of interest, uh, also year. So it's a still relatively simple bookmarking system, but if you if I copy if I copy this uh, URL and I open it in some uh, browser or anywhere on the phone, you get exactly the same picture. So when you share it, people will see exactly the same. We will we will improve this bookmarking system; it will be more and more comprehensive. So people can also embed this; they can embed open land map on their websites, and some of them they do. Um, so. Uh, so that's the, the open land map. Uh, and now we're working on version two. This is the version two. This one will have also the slider comparison. Uh, and version two, it's way more, it will be way more simple because uh, we'll have all the layers will be just cogs. At the moment, we, we have some layers, cogs, some are not. And we had to import in Geo Server and then we had to have a separate copy on S3. Now the new version, we have everything is in S3. So it's like the front end builds on the on top of the Cox and S3. So it's very portable and it's also fast, we see. Uh, so we can have only one copy of data. So that's the currently what we are, are doing with the, uh, with the open land map. Uh, going back to my slides. So uh, uh, the uh, open land map we're now very happy that we're doing it in open earth monitor uh, project it's the, actually the first time i managed to find some funding to develop it uh, so it's a part of the tier two solution uh, and we want to develop it uh, so it's as i said that it's very easy to uh, add layers very easy to extend and that it's basically on a github so a github community the code will be open source um, and of course the layers will be, uh, it'll be more or less everything is open data. Um, and uh, we also, we have a stack for the open line, stack .org. So that's also uh, installed and ready, but we have to up, improve it a bit. And, um, and then we also look at the uh, request, you know, when you look at many of these themes like land cover, climate, relief, uh, soils, etc. There's a request people want the standard layers, so the standard variables. So like, for example, for land cover, uh, probably people will say, oh, can you put this also 10 meter resolution global? And so we will add all these uh, layers to reduce the gap. So you can find basically all relevant global land cover data sets. Um, also, we, uh, we would like that people start co contributing. So somebody makes a a global uh, um, um, global data and says you know can I add it in your system? Uh, once it's in the system, it means people can if it's a, if they're cooks, so people can query things, they can access things, they can open it in QGIS, etc. So anything you can do with uh, cooks and stack. Uh, so we would like to uh, get uh, also contributions by uh, especially by the partners in the Open Net Monitor, 
so we look really forward um, uh, to get contributions of course you get it you will be it will be your publication you will be the contact you know we we don't want to represent people or anything so uh, people that create data they will remain as the contact uh, people for the um, anybody that uses data um, of course the idea with the open land map eventually is to have majority of uh, global uh, layers not 100 percent but to have a majority um, and that it becomes really comprehensive uh, in this workshop what so what i'm going to talk in this workshop um, so i'm going to talk a bit about these backgrounds and how did we uh, decided about um, these principles of open land map um, then also i will talk about something that sounds silly but file naming convention it's a very interesting thing we thought it's going to be easy <laughs> easy to solve but uh, i will see how complex it can get just the file naming just to get the how do we name the files um, then we also want to integrate point data so any lots of these maps they come from the points let me show you that so here if i look uh, this is a map of biomes uh, potential natural rotation. So here's the map of biomes, and you see that we can also put the points, and the points are clickable, so you can see what are the values of the points. So you can validate, you can validate kind of the, you can understand the, the predictions, you know, they come from the points, and you can understand this relationship. Um, and you can see, if you zoom in to some point, you can really validate, you know, say this, okay, this one I have here, class 13, uh, temperate deciduous broadleaf forest and then I click on it and I say yes temperate forest so it matches the the prediction matches the training point sometimes they don't they don't match you know because it's uh, any machine learning any modeling you know you have to smooth you smooth a bit of signal right so uh, so but the idea is also to have these points integrated seamlessly yes Peter Sure, we have microphone, no problem. I don't know whether there is anyone online. I think in the room it would be okay. But uh, when you speak about points and you say you, of course, have some, some issues in, in addressing or how do you integrate these points, just one remark. Of course, these points as observations are not points. They, are, they, they represent an area. And you will have to make at a certain point a decision on how big that area is. There are some so-called point data like the Lucas survey where we know the, the point that is really classified is I think a 10 centimeter disc or something like that. Here if you speak about forest honestly a forest cannot be just a, a square meter because on a square meter you cannot say what a forest is on a, on, on a square meter so it, it, you have to give them a certain extent. If you give them a certain extent you can assign them a certain cell and you will just choose the, 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 the resolution of the cell according to this decision of the representativity of this information, that, that label that you have. And then if you, depending on what system you use, but if you have a, 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 an indexing system for your cells, you just preserve that cell. And that is then, first of all, relatively efficient in a DGGS, for example, that is the point, that's all you need. You take the index of the cell and you, you are done. You have a, a covered the position and the extent in one in one uh, number so to say but you could of course in a classical coordinate uh, uh, system based grid do the same and that would as i say circumvent this this kind of issue that uh, you don't really know to what area you refer and you should okay your sensitivity about this uh, issues of definition it's with bit by beyond what we worry about at the moment but uh, i agree there is uh, the proper way to do it is yes to uh, at least add in metadata so people can see what is the um, uh, support even of the points but i just wanted to here emphasize that we we want a system that you people understand that this map comes from these points and of course there is also uh, there will be a publication explaining it um, so people can understand whether this comes from and uh, they can read about it and they can get all the details. So we want that it's also like an open science based portal that's also in a, in a spirit of this project open at monitor. Um, going back to the slides. 
Um, yes, so um, we have also some open issues. Uh, so um, we, uh, we have now more and more data coming up and we will have probably high storage cost and uh, we are looking at, we, we want to minimize the open land map, we want to make it really like open street map, so not for profit, uh, sustainable, so we have to really minimize the cost. So we are looking at how we can do that and it is possible in theory, you can, you can just put, for example, all data on Zenodo and you can build up an interface uh, to all the data hosted on Zenodo and just build the interface and all the API and people can access, but it's, it's, uh, it's not something that we are considering now. We have our own storage, uh, but eventually it will be interesting to reduce the cost. And we are going to start uh, own scientific journal. It will be a data journal. Uh, it will start next year. And we will use this as a platform once the, some paper gets accepted. Uh, we will then put the paper integrated. Uh, so I think that will be the best way also to uh, do quality control. Um, but of course, once we do that, so um, um, we need to get all the uh, reviewers and committee, scientific committee and organize that. But uh, in principle, this is also to start a scientific journal. Uh, so question, why do you need open land map if you have Google Earth Engine, right? Yes. Yes. But does the cost also evolve with the amount of access? If it's like more heavily used, like if it's certainly like tomorrow, like thousands of people decide to use these layers that, that are in this cloud native uh, format. Yes, yes, the, that increases the cost, it put, yes. It puts a higher load on the web yes. server, right? Yeah, it increases the cost. The cost you, storage cost, you pay the amount of data put and the traffic, right? Okay. There are some services that uh, you can block, for example, you say, well, if it's uh, above some a number per month or something, then it starts blocking, so we don't pay extra. But then, then it blocks people, so they cannot access. But for, for viewing the data, there's small traffic. When I, when I do something like this, uh, sorry, here, when I, when I do, uh, you know, something here viewing, this is all small cost. When people download or want to download whole data, if we have like eight terabytes and everybody wants to download eight terabytes, then the traffic goes really high, right? And, but the question is, why do, do you need these eight terabytes? You know, maybe you just need some local data. If, even if you if you need global data, maybe you don't need the resolution like 100 meter or something. You can just, you know, aggregate to one kilometer. And so related to that, is there a bit of a cyber security consideration? I mean, for instance, if we had the GRC, if we would like put all these freely available HTTP uh, like uh, raster layers, which in GRC is like constantly being attacked. Yes, that yeah, yes. That yeah. would be a problem or is that? Yes, we, we don't, at, at the moment this data is on OVH and we're looking at Wasabi, so they do have some security. Uh, but yeah, it's also an issue. It's also, we are not a GRC, right? But uh, it's also an issue. Yeah. So uh, yes, the, uh, one of the reasons for this workshop, I, I want to talk with you, you know, to see what are your exp uh, experiences because we don't, we don't have a solution for everything. So we don't know some things, how to do it properly. We, we do, you see, we can make it very fast and we can make it simple and we can make it scalable. Uh, and we do, we desperately need uh, this system. It's now really, we are really struggling because I will show you, we have so much data and the data is just files, you know. If we want to visualize it, I mean, I can make a, in QGS, I can show you, you know, here's the data, but this is on my QGS on my computer. I mean, I want to put it somewhere that people can seamlessly just, you know, find things and play these videos. Uh, so we are desperately need need a system. Okay, just about the the Google Earth Engine. So in US, you know, many university PhD students they just have a group and somebody just says, hey, you know, just use Google Earth Engine, right? They don't even buy software anymore. Um, so the question is, and and you know, Google Earth Engine is, um, and the Google Maps it's all like this cloud services, so they really optimize also, and you have. Uh, I think Google Maps is used by 1.5 billion people every day. Um, they also have this really nice data catalog. So 
you can see all these layers. Um, and um, and it's really nicely done. Of course, it's a it's a really big infrastructure, and you could you could do and also our open land map. If you go to the catalog, you can find open land map layers. Right? So we are not against this catalog and Google Earth Engine. You know, it's not that we say, oh no, this is bad. We are good and stuff. So it is really fantastic, and we are personally jealous. You know, um, but we think we we would still like to make something which is because with Google, I think you have to register you if you want to do some processing you can do it you have to do it in their system if you want to download some data you have to uh, extend your google drive and so there are some limitations and and it is google earth engine it is now split so there's a commercial google earth engine and there's the research so as soon as you start doing something where people use it for decisions you're actually in the business model and then you can have actually high cost to uh, do some project. Uh, you guys at JFC use Google Earth Engine? There's no policy to not use it, and it depends on the team or the individual. Okay. Okay. We have a computing infrastructure within the JRC. Yes. The GOP. GODPP, yes. It's a bit, it's a bit difficult abbreviation. <laughs> Uh, okay, but uh, so, but for example, what I like this person, Sama Priya Roy, and he made this awesome Google Earth and Community Catalog. And to be honest with you, uh, we want to make something like this, just open land map, so you don't you don't have to go to Google Earth Engine. So basically, except except here you have you have all possible layers, also regional US layers. We will make one which is just global layer. So that's what we would like to do. But more or less, idea is to, uh, so in very simple terms, we would like to put most of the open uh, global layers, environmental layers, in the open land map, make a catalog, and uh, make it a community so people can contribute and also make them scientific journal so people can send things. And uh, if you look at the uh, for example, making like a, a global GIS. Um, in principle, you have basically raster and vector data, right? So that's simple. Um, and um, for the rasters, you have, uh, well, I'm not going to talk this uh, DGGS and how you organize it, but let's say it's very simple. It's just basically images, you know, that if you make, let's say, global layers, and if you use one projection system, and if you choose standard pixel sizes you just stack all these images they can have different dates etc but you basically stack them together and with vectors you you have point lines polygons but let's say polygons we don't really need because we can also rasterize but we do need a solution for points and lines um, and then uh, in principle when you think further about it so both points and vectors today uh, you know, rasters, uh, sorry, rasters and uh, vectors. Uh, rasters, you can put them like in a multi-array, so it's kind of also table. And also vectors, if you put in, um, in this um, uh, SF, uh, simple, uh, simple features, right? It's or geopandas and things, it's also kind of tabular data. So basically you have tables uh, from both sides. Um, and then uh, uh, the raster data usually satellite images now mainly, but also there are predictions. Uh, also, you can have a digital terrain model, then you run some modeling, uh, flow modeling, I don't know, um, 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 some climatic modeling. And the vector data usually uh, points, that's the most interesting, but now there's also these point clouds, you can have really big data sets. Um, and I will show you some data sets we have. Um, this is the... Uh, the universe of uh, software you use uh, most of coding at OpenGeoHub, I think it's in Python. Um, and these are kind of packages we use. There's a different package for processing, Raster.io, uh, these GeoPandas, and then uh, NumPy and uh, Scikit-Learn. And then for visualization, uh, this uh, Matplotlib and Grafana uh, to build the dashboards. Um, and then there's a one package we're also developing within OpenLandMap. Uh, it's called Scikit-Map. Uh, so that's the package we put most of our processing workflows. So it's all now at one place. And uh, this is only the one which is based on machine learning, right? 
Um, and we are really inspired, Open Land Map is inspired by, for example, Mastodon. You know, it's an open source uh, project. Uh, I, I think it's uh, been programmed by uh, one person made the Mastodon code. And uh, I don't know how many million of users now it has, but it's uh, really took off, I think. Uh, it's not for profit and it's a federated system. So you, everybody, you can install it on Mastodon. Um, and then also, of course, we, are, we want to work close with OSGEO. And so most of, most of the processing we do in, based on OSGEO. Um, also very interesting speaking about um, the uh, OpenGIS and uh, geospatial technologies. I don't know if you saw the uh, TV series, The Billion Dollar Code. So it's based on a true story, apparently. And uh, it tells the story that this TerraVision was way before uh, Google Earth. Uh, and it was in uh, Germany, I think. Uh, it was a, um, a two, two uh, developers made that uh, first um, a digital earth uh, system that was scalable. Um, but so that's something we can be, let's say, a bit proud of. So we do, we did start, I think, many open source GS, open source geospatial projects we started in Europe. Um, okay, so how to organize uh, Arco layers? Are you familiar with Arco? Analysis ready, cloud optimized, Arco. Remember that, so, so that means, uh, I, I can talk about it later, but you, I think you'll get an idea quickly. Uh, so how to organize it so that it's fast to view, easy to uh, access and comes with an API and everything on low cost. And the solution is of course to use Cox and to uh, use Stack and then also, if possible, to register also the workflows. Do you know there's a snake make? It's a workflow catalog. So you can register in stack index your data. And if you use Python, you can register your workflow. And you have both things registered. So the workflow and the data. So the only thing is missing is somewhere to register point data. But let's say you register on Zenodo. And then you have the point data on Zenodo, you have the, the stack index, all the grid data, and you have the, the uh, workflow you register, and then you have the whole thing registered. So every map you then see, uh, technically speaking, it could, you could have everything in a catalog and registered. So that's something we would like to also uh, do uh, with the open land map. The other thing in open land map we are very interested is, if you remember the talk by Julia Wagemann on, uh, on the first day, there are these top five uh, problems of uh, the modern challenges of bigger data. Uh, and one of them is too many data platforms and portals and data discovery. So that, that comes also very, um, uh, very high. So I'm going to talk about that, how we try to resolve that. Um, and, um, and then the other problem is the, the data you, know, you want to use. Uh, you want that this data is as much as possible what is called analysis ready, uh, ART. Uh, so the analysis ready, you know, if you, in most simple term, if you say analysis ready, if you want to uh, overlay points, or if you want to aggregate data, or if you want to get estimates for some units, then the data is uh, consistent, complete, correct. Uh, so it's uh, ready to do analysis. Um, COGS, uh, is anybody that is not familiar with COGS? Anybody doesn't use COGS? No, so we can make this short, but uh, obviously it's amazing development. Uh, when about 10 years ago, or even like, I think three years ago, the COGS were just experimental. Uh, I think officially they started about two years ago. Uh, but it's really magical. You you create this data and um, it becomes like a geospatial database. But it's just a file. I mean, it's just a T file basically. But it's so intelligently organized that you can you know grab uh, pieces of data. You can uh, find a tile or something. You can very quickly uh, get uh, data without having to download the whole chunk of data. Um, and also, what is nice about Cox, as, as you know, you can uh, find the Cox file and you can just drop it now in QGS. Uh, so you just drop it and, and magically it will display uh, in the background. And so you work in QGS, but actually the data, it's on some uh, server. 
and you don't have to download this data set is uh, 120 gigabyte this is the global uh, land cover data set and i can do the same thing as you can see here i can copy this and i can open it in qgs let me see add layer so i add it as a http service and now it takes a bit of time to connect but in principle the data is here uh, and then i would just have to zoom in somewhere i will have to zoom in and then i can see uh, pieces of the data and then if i want uh, data for some part of italy i don't know local i just have to say crop it here what i like you say crop this window and then I get a local copy of the data. But otherwise, there's no need. I didn't download 120 gigabyte. I only displayed the data that I needed uh, for the for the view for the place that I was looking at. And so that's quite magical with the uh, cogs, um, and uh, makes everybody work with it very seamlessly. Also, you can make R or Python code where you just have a pointer to this file. And you program uh, cropping and things. You make a code to crop it or to do overlay to get points. And you can even run it in parallel. You can do up to 10 requests in parallel. So if you have, uh, for example, uh, 100 points, you split them into 10 chunks of 10 points and you send it and it will do overlay and return it the results of overlay. So that's very, very efficient and makes access to the data very easy, very seamless. Um, and uh, of course, this uh, Cox now is becoming standard. Well, USGS uses it. Um, the AWS, you have uh, lots of products of Cox. Uh, and also in uh, um, Microsoft Planetary Computer, they also have a ni very nice uh, stack, actually, uh, of their layers. I think Google Earth Engine doesn't use it. I don't think so. So that's, that's something interesting. In Google Earth Engine, you don't have a access to cogs you can only access uh, their infrastructure by logging in in their system uh, what is arco analysis ready cloud optimized so there are four words the four c's complete consistent current and correct um, complete you know you know you don't want to have clouds or missing values or you know i mean if you can of course you want to fill in all the gaps and have the data as complete as possible uh, then consistent and current, uh, obviously current means that you're giving a most recent version of the data and then correct also you want to give people the best quality data. So if you have multiple versions, you give them the most up to date and the best data you have. And that makes it then ARCO. Uh, and there's a video by, uh, by Marius Appello about the COGS if you want to watch. Uh, it's really nicely explained, especially how to access COGS from R. Okay, so we, uh, we looked at the problem of terrain. Uh, if you look now, there's more and more teams making more or less similar data set when it comes to land cover, terrain, um, climate, etc. So in the case of terrain, if you go to the open topography, and they have these global uh, DMs, and you will see that there's, there's about four or five global DMs produced by different groups. There's the NASA DM, there's the um, ALOS Japanese World 3D, there's the Copernicus a Global D, uh, DM. So there's about four uh, Global DMs. And so now somebody who's agnostic uh, and comes first thinks, so which one do I use? And uh, that, that's what Yule Wagemann says, there's too many things so people get confused. So which one do I use? Um, and um, there is this now point data. So luckily there's a reference point data from um, ISAT2 and some people went and compared, uh, they compared all these different DMs and they just, for example, uh, Peter Good, I know him and uh, he did his comparison and he says, yeah, Copernicus is uh, better, uh, but also it's not perfect. So. Um, when he compared these data sets, says, yeah, Copernicus seems to be better. Copernicus wins, you see, that's the name of the article. But it's not 100% win, it's just, it's just a bit better. So he said Copernicus wins, but it's a bit better. It's not that it's like three times better. Um, 
So what I did uh, for Europe, I uh, took this, uh, the GLOW 30, the Copernicus, the Japanese, um, then I looked at them and actually when I look at some places with forest, I can see the forest trees. And uh, so obviously they are, they are a di digital surface models, so they cover the surface of everything. And then the only really digital terrain model at that time was the Merit DTM, because the, the group in Japan, they did really extensive work to filter out uh, the vegetation, but it was at 100 meter. So you have this problem that you have this very detailed surface models, Copernicus and AWS. And on the other hand, you have the Merit DM, but it's only 100 meter, and this one's a 30 meter. And uh, so what I did, I downloaded the Jedi and ISA 2, uh, both points, and I extracted the height of terrain, so the different uh, columns in the both data sets. And so we downloaded the whole these things and we prepared the data for Europe. And you can see it looks like this. Uh, this one is, uh, let me see. I, this is the jetty. Yeah, so that's the jetty. Jetty stops at uh, 50 degrees, I think. So beyond 50 degrees, there's nothing. And then ISA 2, it goes all the way. Um, but it's more, a bit more difficult to download and to prepare. I said too, it's bigger. So we prepared all this data and then uh, we got about 9 million points, best quality. So you can also subset based on the quality. And then uh, we prepared uh, covariate layers. We also added canopy height, bare earth probability, surface water probability. So we added all these layers and I ran the ensemble machine learning and then we produce the uh, predictions and you can see that the merit dm matches the, the best if you just linear you do linear comparison the merit dm matches the best the uh, the jedi and isa2 it's mainly because of vegetation right and then you get a standard error of about 7.1 meter so that's the average error of estimating terrain height and after i do the machine learning then I got a average error 6.5. So it's a 0 0.6 meter improvement. It's not too large, but it is still worth it uh, to add that extra modeling to uh, filter out um, and to create ensemble. It's a large data set, nine, 9 million training points. So I run it in the full parallelization. I run on the MLR. You can run in fully parallelized. And, uh, and this is what we get as a Different. So this was original um, Copernicus you see here, and this is after uh, I ran this machine learning. So we managed to remove all this forest. So you see they kind of disappear. It's kind of like a phase treatment. Imagine somebody comes with acne or something, and then you say we're going to fix it, no problem. So so that so that kind of worked nice, but it's not perfect. If you look at some areas like here, you can still see some vegetation. So it's not. It's not 100%, you know, it's not that it solves all the problems. So there are still problems, but in general, it's, I think it was a quite okay for beginning. It was quite okay result. Um, and then we put it, we did it for Europe, we put it online and we, uh, we, we published it in a dozen paper, everything explained so you can read about how it's done. Um, then we said, okay, uh, that works fine. Let's do the whole world. And, uh, this is the work done by Yu Fong. So he went, he took all the, the whole world and of course he programmed everything with tiles. So you have to split everything first. And then uh, he did, uh, he merged uh, four DTMs, national DTMs, merit DTM, ALOS and GLOW 30. And uh, at this stage we said, okay, the, to do all this machine learning, it's too much. So let's just do 10% lower quantile. So if you have these surface models, if you take a 10% 10, 10 lower quantile, you will always go, if you have a high standard deviation of the values, it will always go for the 10% lowest quantile. It means it will take not the minimum, but like a lowest, on the lowest edge. So it's it, because it's just to be safe, that's usually easy way to filter out vegetation. And so he did that and he produced this uh, one image. That's the one I was just showing you in QGS. Uh, and the images, let me see, 1 million, 1.3 million by uh, half million pixels. So it's a pretty big image, <laughs> uh, but it's the whole, and it's just a cog, right? Uh, it is 120 gigabyte, I think, 
but if you, as I said, if you go to QGS, you can easily add it. You just go um, add as a as a cog, and it will display. If I zoom into some area, it will download this uh, part, and you see here I have a, a terrain model, global terrain model, uh, cloud optimized. It's seamlessly ready to do analysis and do two things. And uh, what we are doing now next is uh, we will um, we will um, uh, improve that. So we will we are now getting all the ISA data and JEDI data. I'll show you. We got the JEDI data with the whole world, and we're going to run that, and we're going to produce a, a new version of this ensemble terrain model. And once we finish that, then we'll uh, uh, generate about 15, 20 uh, terrain variables at 30 meter. Uh, so like a slope and um, um, uh, northness, eastness, um, wetness index, catchment area, etc. So we'll also derive that. Uh, and then we'll have it ready, uh, ready to go. This is just visual comparison. Um, in open land map. This is just visual comparison. Visually, you don't see big differences, but because it's a surface model, we do take out everywhere we have vegetation, just to be sure we, we take it out, and then we do this uh, 10 percentile, and then here's the standard deviation from this, um, the multiple data sources. Um, and of course, we put the code, uh, the code with all the processing, we put it in uh, Python uh, computational notebook, so you can even see how exactly it's done. Because it could, there could be some issue in the processing, maybe we did a mistake, so uh, you can follow that. Uh, Giuseppe and uh, colleagues, they made this geomorph for 90 meter, um, something like three years ago. And also they made this uh, hydrography in 90 meter. Um, but so we are not going to repeat all this modeling, but we want to select a couple of things and uh, repeat the modeling at 30 meters. So that's the that's coming up in open land map. So we'll repeat that and we hopefully will have an open land map next year. We'll have all these layers at 30 meter as a reference layers, cloud optimized Arco. <coughs> Are ready to go with documentation and anybody in the world can use it without uh, restrictions. We might have to get uh, the uh, code, the API code for people because once we get, once we do things experimentally, you can have like 100 people testing, but we are afraid if we get like 10,000 people, it could crash the system, so we have to get then probably the code, but it will be like Zenodo code, you know, you just register, get the code and you use it. Um, and that's, I think, what you ask about security, right? I think that's the best way to avoid security issues to have people register so you know the identity of uh, people. Uh, also, Giuseppe has a nice uh, seminar, a webinar uh, he did while he was at Open Geohub and uh, about hydrography 90 meter. I highly recommend watching. It's the whole story. It's really complex. Uh, so I highly recommend watching if you have time. Um, Uh, what goes in open land map? Um, um, how do we decide? So uh, first of all, we only take open data. So CC by CC by share alike open database license. We require that uh, data is uh, for the whole land mask. So if the data is incomplete, we're not going to take it. If you miss more than 1% of the land mask, then it's for us incomplete. We want uh, that all the processing is documented in code. So the same way I showed you what um, Ufong did with the uh, terrain. So we want it openly documented in computational notebooks, that the methods are peer reviewed. Uh, at least there's enough detailed technical documentation. Uh, and that the authors take responsibility to update, maintain, and keep, keep tidy. And they respond to all the questions. And also, we will prefer that there's a copy of the data available in some secure place. So, for example, Zenodo. Uh, so, ideally, all the data should have a DOI and uh, it's registered. So, and there's always a backup copy so people can access. And we will also like that people recommend that they um, add training points uh, so that in the same way I showed you with the biomes, that you can see the maps and you can see where the maps come from. So, the training points. Um, so our situation now is that we generate more and more data uh, and 
I will just show you now some data sets that we don't have in open land map and it, it hurts because I would, you know, we produce this very interesting data sets and then, um, you know, it's not available. It's not easy for people, you know, to go to Zenodo and look at, for example, I don't know, 500 files and then go like, what is this? Like, how do I, what I'm looking at? So one of the examples uh, I created, um, this nightlight images. So I'll just show you how it looks like on Zenodo. So it looks like this and uh, I put some little documentation. I put a preview, right? And you have, these are just cogs. You can open them also. I can just copy the link and open in, uh, well, let me see, I can open in uh, QGS. So here's directly from uh, Zenodo. So that's also possible because they're all cogs. We always make cogs, we always put the cogs. So here's the, now, now it's a problem is the display. So I have to copy the display, let me see. So here we have some image. And as I said, this image is now, it's not on my computer locally. It's on, uh, it's, you can see the URL, it's an auto. So it's from Zenodo, but if I, if I zoom in somewhere, it's uh, seamlessly integrated and we would just display this little chunk that needs to display. Uh, also even it reprojects uh, for this coordinate system I use. Um, so this is, for example, one layer that we only have on Zenodo. But it's very interesting layer and you could, you could, there's so much things here, you know, it's a, it's a 500 meter resolution layer and um, it's, uh, here is the original uh, copy of the data. You can see here, there's a paper explaining how it was made. And so what I did here, uh, I discovered that they only have from 2011 to 2021. But we are interested always 2000, 2020 plus. So what I did, I extrapolated the values uh, back time. So I created new bands, new layers, about 11 years I created going backwards. And um, this is possible. You can do that because the, the growth of nightlight images, if, as you see here, it's kind of like it's, uh, it's like a growth function. You know, these growth functions or, or decay functions, there's decay and growth functions. So it's kind of exponential. And basically you can take for every uh, line of pixels, you can fit a model and then use that model to extrapolate back in time. So that's what I did for all the pixels. So I fit for every pixel, I fit a model. So it's like millions of models uh, or more uh, billions, maybe, I don't know. And then I fitted models and I created the data. And uh, what you can look at now, for example, this is the 2021 versus 2000 uh, versus 2000. So, so you can see how the night lights increased. And uh, let's see, let's take a look at the Venice. So we can look at the Venice. And uh, so this will be the sorry, this will be the 2021 2000. So the night lights increased, you know, the urbanization. So in many places in the world, you have this increase in urbanization. I can go and look at maybe uh, Shanghai. I think that's way more interesting. So you can see the Shanghai and you can see this is how it looked like back in, uh, this is 2021 and this 2000. So you can see this urbanization, the growth of all these places. And then what I made on top of it, I also made the difference map. So the red one is the uh, positive difference in night lights over 20 years and the blue ones is stagnation or a decrease in night light. So you can see it's all, it's all red here, right? But it's amazing how many pixels are red, right? You, you don't see them maybe when this, uh, uh, when you do black and white, but you can see it's uh, like there's so much actual urbanization happening over the 22 years. Peter, yes? When you say the 2020 data, you, you essentially, you modeled those, right? They are not observations, they are simulations, I would no, call No, it, they, no, they are, they are predictions, they are, 
extrapolation. It's extrapolation. Oh, extrapolation, but yeah. but they are basically because there was no virus, obviously, yes. so it, you don't have. No. So no. it's basically based on on a model assumption. So it's something yeah. that you do in meteorology as forecast. You do it as as hindcast. Yes. Okay. But I looked at the night lights and yeah. uh, I opened, for example, hundred pixels. I pick up. And in all these pixels, it's like a growth or decay functions. It's, there's no like that it's uncertainty. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of, you know, like when you make a, a dough for the cake or something, you know, it just grows slowly. There's no like oscillations, you know, this. So, so that gives me confidence to extrapolate that. So these models have a low, low error, you know. Mm -hmm. Because it's very. Are you, are you calculating? That would be the, 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 the second part of the question. Are you estimating an uncertainty to this extrapolation? Um, I don't have it as a map, but yes, okay. In, okay. in my code, I can also estimate for every pixel. That would be fantastic to supply yes. it with, because yes. especially if it's a simulation, it's it's even more important to give kind of an uncertainty range yes. within that that is that is that prediction. I, I haven't made the map hold. of the uncertainty, but I remember checking many pixels and actually the, the fits are like almost all the points on the line. There's mm -hmm. very little uh, oscillations. It's really what I'm trying to say. If you take one pixel, you take somewhere in Milano, right? And these pixels, they, the only thing that difference is the speed of growth or the or, or like uh, the beginning point. That's the only things that really matters. Once you get that, you know, you match like 98% the values. So the uncertainty is very low, right? But of course, if there is wars or something, like if Ukraine now, there's a war yeah. and there's these break points, you know, where yeah. things don't happen, they suddenly you have a destruction or something. Of course, you know, the, 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 these models wouldn't work. I mean, okay. but, but uh, for the 98% of the world in the last 20 years, you know, you don't have like a Ukraine, like some serious <laughs> wars. Okay. It's just really the question of the speed of growth, you know. And when you look at some places in Asia, you have a really steeper growth, and some places in Europe you have stagnation. But for example, let's look at uh, Milan, right? If you look at Milan, then the, the the old city is kind of stagnation, but then you have around it you have all this red area, so the the uh, surrounding is uh, growing. Without going into this analysis, what I'm trying to tell you is that. We have a lot of this data. Uh, that's why we really suffer with this open land map because we would like to expose this data so people can see these patterns, you know, because there's so much data we are producing and we realize that uh, we need some platform where we can visualize that because you can make amazing data set, but nobody is uh, able to look at it. And we are now here. Let's take a look at Bolzano. So here's the Bolzano and you can see Bolzano is mainly uh, mainly red also, but there's a places, old city, I don't know where it's uh, stagnating. So there's not a, not a huge uh, difference. Um, so that was one of the layers I wanted to show you. Uh, then. What, sorry? No, no, it's a stagnation or decrease. Some places you have a decrease also. So, for example, somewhere where they move industry, if they move from some place industry. Yeah, so, let's see. So let's take a look. So this is the. Uh, this was the 2000. Uh, this 2000 is 2021. So this is the growth. So it looks like the most of growth is the southern part, these uh, places here. But uh, the, bl the blue shows, so if it's darker blue, it means it's a de bit decrease in uh, night lights, uh, but it also means zero. And if it's a no value, it means there was no lights, no night lights. Yes, if, that, if all these places here, it means no night lights. There's many pixels, they have no night lights. I think probably about 70% of the world is uh, no night lights ever in this uh, 20, uh, 20 years. I don't know. So, but it's a very, it's a very, it's a very interesting, and uh, I was actually shocked to see how much red it is. Um, but we don't have a place to uh, show this data. 
that we don't like we're just in Zenodo and you don't get an effect right if you want to effect to reach people to and that, that look at it and understand this urbanization where does it happen you know you need to compute all these indices and then you need to make it available seamlessly for them in WebGIS that they can just play with a hand or they can just zoom in even children you know they can play uh, so we have these few data sets, so night, night lights and trend estimates, then also this FAPAR. So we just got this paper on FAPAR. We produce 1.4 terabyte of data, right? Now we're putting the data on Zenodo. We don't have a place to um, uh, store it. Zenodo is the only place. The guy is now uploading 1.4 terabyte to Zenodo. They made a code. They had to hack the Zenodo to make a code uh, to generate uh, multiple buckets. We need like I don't know, 50 buckets. So, so they generate multiple buckets and then they split the data and then they link all the buckets and things. So we had to make a Python code with this Zenodo API. And now we are uploading from multiple, one from the office. At the office we have one IP, so you have a limited speed, but we also put it at home. So we are uploading from home and, and, uh, and it will take still uh, four days to upload 1.4 terabyte. But let's say we will get it to Zenodo, so we make this data available. Um, and uh, it's also very exciting data because we uh, calculated this world without people so you can see the potential it's amazing this is the first time by the way you watching this is not this like fresh work right it's just after six months of preparation we finally got everything and so this is the the world without people so you can see how vegetation will look like today at 250 meter resolution a monthly if there was no human influence so no cities no uh, crop plants um, uh, no, um, what was it? Uh, no, no population density, no night lights. You know, so that's how the world will look like. And um, and then we calculated this uh, difference between actual and potential. So the both blue areas and the red areas are both interesting. You want to understand, for example, some some places very easy to see the blue areas and you understand it. It's irrigation, right? Where you have irrigation, you produce more biomass than then nature can produce, right? It's very simple. But some places we have also red, and we don't understand, you know, why, why is it red? We don't know, we just calculated everything. But we need to expose this data now. And if we just put it on the node, people, you know, they, they, they will take them time to see that. So we need to put that in open line map, really. And we need to expose it so it's very clear that people can zoom in and they can see and they can overlay with other layers and they can do the slider and compare things. Uh, this, this is the thing I want to show you. These are the these are the most also interesting things. It's like uh, positive negative trends. So this is not about potential. This is just purely uh, based on the time series of 22 years. Uh, for every pixel, we fit a trend model, and we estimate uh, the beta of the model. Uh, and that it's after we take out the seasonality, we do this seasonalization, and then we fit the trends of really these annual values. And so what happens, you have this uh, red and green pixel. So I'll show you this on QGS. So it's also super interesting. So the first thing that pops up, if I zoom, if I zoom out, the first thing that you see, it's most of the world is green, especially if you look, if you look at China and India, they're very green, right? So that's the first thing that pops up. But if I zoom in, for example, somewhere in Brazil, if I zoom in somewhere here, you can see, ah, when I zoom in more, there's green areas, but there's also these red areas. So I get something like this. So, so what I can do now, I can, maybe I'll turn this layer off the Google Labs. Uh, I can take this uh, layer and I can download it. So here I can download that layer. And let me now open it. Um, so that's the one I just downloaded. So I can open it in Google Earth. And what's nice about Google Earth? Well, first I can uh, set up a transparency. So here we can see that. So it, see, it matches, you know, the, the background. So let's set up this transparency. But what's also very useful in Google Earth uh, you can we can scroll back in time so we can look at the images going back uh, and what happens is that uh, we reconstruct this and eventually as you see that used to be all forest 
right? It used to be forest, and then and then people uh, slowly started converting without going now blaming anybody personally, but you can see there's been a conversion of all these forests. You can see that years when they uh, massively converted, so that's 2013 to 2015, right? So this all been massively converted. And then if I look, uh, so I look at the most recent time, and if we look at the, this FAPR, you can see this negative FAPR. So without mistake, uh, this conversion, uh, again, without blaming anyone, and you know, often if you convert the land to some different land use, of course, if you remove the forest, it's a per, like, let's say it's a permanent forest, and you do something seasonal, of course, your FAPR is going to drop. So FAPR drops down, and but we can map this now all this area. Some places you have it's greener. You see many places still greener. And the whole planet, one more time, it does get greener. If you look at uh, a lot of the planet, it does get really greener. Even in Brazil, there's uh, places where it gets greener. And this, this thing that you see, no change, of course, this is, means there's still a tropical forest that are kind of untouched. And so we have a proof that all these places are untouched for the last 22 years. If I look at the Europe, uh, as I said, it's mainly green. This thing has to do now with the cogs a bit. So imagine with the cogs, you know, you look at only in the, these gen, uh, aggregated values. So if you look at it, it looks, oh, it's all beautiful, it's all green, but actually it's very patchy. So if you zoom in somewhere in France, you can see that there's also reddish, uh, individual pixels reddish. Uh, I don't know now why it happened, you know, so that's something I will be very interested to get people to use. But we can see a lot of also reddish areas, but they get uh, it, these pixels get eaten out by uh, because of this aggregation, the the pyramids, you know. So you see here actually probably about 50% of pixels are red. Uh, so so that's something also interesting to see why it happens. And uh, uh, usually you have also uh, like if you look at the big cities, I don't know. Let me turn on the Paris. Yes. Ah, uh, yes, uh, windfall, okay. Yeah, that's in Basque country, I think, right? <laughs> Let me see. Not this, not this, uh, this one here. I think that's the Basque, the French Basque country. Yes. Uh, okay, but you can see there's a lot of red, so lots of loss in uh, vegetation. Uh, but it's very patchy, you know, it's not like it's all. It's really, co it's really complex. So. We are hoping now to do like a 30 meter resolution models and to get also that high, much higher resolution, you know, to see even even more detail. But I'd like to see. Yeah, I will have to know where I have to zoom because now it's a bit. Okay. I see, I see some patches of red, but still I will say it's a, it's a, it's a surprising that Europe is so green. I mean, uh, we this is the beta of 0 0.1, 0 0.15 beta, right? Imagine this 0 0.15 is like this. So it's really gentle, gentle changes, you know, in 20 years. Uh, some places we have 0 0.3, you know. So so if I if I change the scale, let me tr let me show you that. So now we exaggerate that we are really looking at gentle uh, changes. But if I go here and I look at some places, and now I'm going to uh, change the display. Let me see. So now it's, uh, as I said, zero. So it's 0 0.1. So let's put it 0 0.3. So, and I want to make it fair. So it's a, uh, symmetric so 0 0.3 this way 0 0.3 this way and now if i display you can still see this still pick up as a red so so especially like here i would say this is really critical land degradation so something um, i mean vegetation wise there's a really loss in fapar so that's no mistake but but then in uh, europe you see it disappears in europe you you it, it's a bit greenish but it's just a gentle greenish it's not it's not that we are now like we double vegetation or something. We just increase a bit vegetation. Why the world vegetation increased, the FAPR increased, you can read it. It's been explained in a paper. It has to do with the 
I think uh, also more CO2 in the atmosphere or something. Um, and also, if you look at the India and China, it's no mistake, it's really much greener uh, because of the intensive agriculture. So they do a lot of irrigation and you can see uh, the agriculture is more intensive. In the last 20 years, they really increased the vegetation. So that's no, no mistake that mm -hmm. comes up uh, very clearly. Uh, so, and now you see we have this data, we, we cannot uh, basically share it, and it's, it's a painful. Um, we are looking at some tools in QGIS, so we, we uh, create these uh, videos and we explain to people if you want to visualize, to see all time series as a nice uh, package in a plugin in QGIS called Layer Grid View. So if you put, for example, uh, multiple years or months and things, you can visualize, you can see these things. So I encourage you in the meantime, until we get this data and open land map, you can use this thing to visualize. Um, then what also came out uh, just, uh, just recently, they put all this uh, land cover, 30 meter, a Chinese group, uh, Chinese Academy of Sciences. They, uh, they made this uh, 30 meter time series annual data set. Uh, it goes all the way actually back um, even before 2000. They, they did were five years, uh, but it's a lot of data and we are now just processing this data and we'll prepare COGS uh, with everything. And also we want to put it in open land map. So because it's a reference data set and we want to expose it so people can use it very easily um, in a data cube and uh, in a WebGS. Uh, so that's also something we are working on now. So all this, all these data sets they're coming and we are very happy, uh, we are working um, with the WRI and we are very happy we got this copy of Landsat. So we have a copy of the whole Landsat, the ARD Landsat, the version two. And we are also processing that uh, data and we will produce about 50 terabytes. The first round is just 50 terabytes of data, which is the uh, B monthly values uh, of all bands and then also we'll do vegetation in this etc uh, so that will be b monthly and we estimate just by doing this b monthly aggregation we can uh, remove about 40 percent of pixels are clouds you know in uh, 16 day pixels about 40 percent or 50 percent sometimes uh, are the clouds right and you have missing values and so when we do b monthly we come to about uh, 90 percent of pixels available so you have a, like really complete uh, images uh, with the bands. And so we also will process that and, and then we can, you know, we want to make it available to everyone to do work. Um, and of course, we want to put it in open land map. So you're not just you can access, but you can you can see what you're accessing. So you can see what what is the patterns of things if you're doing some modeling. So that's also coming up and uh, we have uh, we have enough storage, you know, to have all that, but we want storage to be some um, hosting you know service um, and uh, hosting service yes yeah, so we're really really hopeful of this um, data data space uh, Copernicus we are hopeful that they will host this data but I have to I don't know how they work so I have to write them some official letter or something uh, but we will be really interested if we could host data on something like this data space or on these uh, platforms from ESA, et cetera, the, the things that we saw in today's presentations. Uh, but we cannot send them like 50 terabyte. I mean, we cannot upload this and we have to send them on disk and things. So we have to see how we're going to do that. Um, so this, all these things are coming, uh, building up this um, B-monthly um, global images. W one image, by the way, Landsat, one band, one image, it's about 150 gigabyte. So, uh, so when you think about it, we can produce 450 of uh, monthly or bi-monthly. And so it's a lot of images. So it's really a lot of data, but it's going to be amazing if we, if we finish that. So it will be uh, really something getting close to us. So uh, like a Arco Landsat. Um, and uh, yeah, we're very excited about it. Okay, the vector data. For vector data, we are testing flat geobuff and geoparquet. Uh, it's kind of, it's not the same level as the COX. It's not the same thing. And both have the pros and cons. So we kind of tend to put the data in both, uh, both formats and both solutions. Um, 
And uh, this large data you can then also display efficiently. So you display only when you zoom in. Um, so, uh, so that's something uh, we're also very excited that there's this cloud solution for vector data coming. Um, we did do something crazy. So we took uh, this jetty and uh, it's about 700 million points, 700 million. It's, I mean, you see the points, right? I mean, when you display them, <laughs> that's, they don't look like points, right? You can only display densities. Um, and if you see, it only goes to 50 degrees uh, north and south. Um, and we extracted this uh, lowest mode, the terrain height, but also the 25, 50, 75, 98, 99, um, um, the uh, aggregated uh, height. So the 99 will be like top of the trees, right? So you have the top of the trees and you have the terrain height. And uh, um, you phone created one file. So it's just a one file. It's crazy. It's also 120 gigabyte. And he just drops it on the in QGS and you, you can display 700 million points. It's possible now with flat geobuff. It's not going to crash your systems. Not like, I mean, if you try to open in memory uh, 120 gigabyte, you just crash the system within uh, 20 seconds. You know, you just run out of RAM and that's it. But now it does work uh, the new version of QGS. You can uh, drag and drop. And um, uh, so that's something amazing. And so we can really put also this, we'll put the ISAT and JD and all these data sets, we'll make them very simple, available as a, just a single file on S3, you know, that you can program with. We'll, we'll write also instructions for people. How do you access, how to use it uh, without crashing your system? And then you will be able to do lots of modeling very quickly. You don't have to download like we had to download like 20 terabytes of data. So, uh, so that's also something uh, exciting. File naming convention. So uh, we had to come up with some file naming convention and I find it very useful in this workshop to discuss this with you. Uh, what do you think about it and do you think it's useful or not? And uh, I, I, I kind of did already see that we have these file names and I think you get the idea that they're a bit like sausage names, right? If I click on something. So it's a bit of like a sausage name. It's a bit long, right? But uh, so I will explain you how what we did and how we decided. And I'm really, very curious to uh, hear from you. So, so we he, first thing on the name is the variable name, right? So for example, land cover land use. Uh, then after the variable name, we put the standard. So the method, for, so for example, land cover, land use based on Louisa. Then we have a kind of variable type. So is it, is it a class? Is it a numeric? Is it probability? So in this case, it's a class, so C. Then we put resolution, the support size, or the, if it's like, if it's uniform, you know, say 30 meter. Uh, then we have vertical reference is it the surface below surface at which depth at which does it start which does it end so we can do 3d data sets also uh, then we have the begin time and end time and they go we at the moment we don't support hours and things we just support days but it can be also it can be extended then we have the the bounding box and bounding box it's like uh, so coordinates of the bounding box or something standard thing you do and you have the EPSG code and the date when the file was generated. And this, we put the V, so the V is like the version. When was the file generated? And so when you look at it, it looks, uh, looks something like this, right? So DTM, Barrett, Ensemble, uh, P10, so it's a peak, uh, lower 10% quantile, 30 meter resolution, it's a variable that uh, uh, is about surface, Earth's surface. And uh, reference here is 2018. Uh, it's a global layer, so global without covering Antarctica. We have a with Antarctica, without Antarctica. It's EPSG 4326, and it's been created on the the 20 um, the 21st of February. Okay, so then we have this file name system. We don't use any uh, capital letters. Uh, we don't use um, uh, we don't need special, so only ASCII, so we only use ASCII, we only use English, we don't accept other languages at the moment. 
and we limit to 256. Uh, be beyond 256, you can really have problems with the files in the older systems. Um, and uh, so, yeah, that's kind of the, in a nutshell, this naming system. If you compare it to MODIS, uh, this is the MODIS file naming conventions. I don't know if we're now worse or better, uh, but in, uh, in this case, uh, you, if you just look at the file name, you kind of have 80% of metadata that you need. You know, you know what is the coordinate system, you know what is the bounding box, uh, you know what is the time reference, you know what is the support. So you get about 80, what I call 80% uh, metadata that you need to make decisions. And now with this file name, for example, we don't have to access the metadata when we program modeling. For example, when we program space-time overlay, we have these uh, uh, names where it says, this is the begin time, end time. And then you find that the points match the begin end time, the in-between begin end time. And then you can do overlay. So you can also do programming just based on the file name. You don't have to really look at the metadata. You don't have to make a separate table. Uh, and we use this underscore to separate the hierarchy of the name. So when you want to just say, I just want to get the begin time, then you will split the names based on this uh, underscore and this will give you just the time. And if you say, I want to get the resolution, I want to get the projection system. So you can extract all these things uh, with this underscore, right? So that's the kind of the file naming system. So I'm really curious uh, what you think about this, if, uh, if it's going to work for you and if you have a better idea, uh, but it's a total pain. It's a total pain because we created now some data sets like this FAPAR I'm showing you, it's a monthly FAPAR for 22 years. So that's, uh, you know, a few thousand files. And if we make small change in file naming, we have to rename everything. <laughs> it's really pain. And then if somebody made the code and it works with these file names and we change the file names, the code doesn't work anymore. And we have to also replace, we have to upload again. We cannot just change the names on the server. We have to upload again the names in uh, S3, you know. In S3, really things get registered, right? So it's a total pain. So we are now, uh, one of the reasons why we delayed with things is if you can believe it, it's just to get the file name, something that is robust and that we can just keep on extending. But if you have any reflection on this, if you have a better, if you saw maybe a better file naming, um, uh, please let us know. How are we doing with the time? Leah? Time. It's almost complete. Seven minutes. Seven minutes, great. Peter? Generally, I think it's a good idea to talk about these things because most people just name their files and don't care what the rest of the <laughs> yeah, world is yeah, doing. Exactly, yeah. So it's, I think that's very good. It reminds me, by the way, of, of how I did it when I was keeping uh, a 20-year archive of, of MODIS data for, for FIS, uh, for, 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 for all of Europe. So nothing about the content we can, we can talk later, but I think it would be really worth to kind of lift that to some sort of like what was done in Stack that start to talk about common band names. It would be important that we get these codes somewhere out and that we start to work on convergence with these codes that we use for the products like DTM, DEM, DSM, these things that are obvious, but there are many others that are not obvious, F, APAR and so on. How do we encode these things? And we should somewhere start an initiative to, to converge on something because we're going to need that when we talk about ARD, when we talk about common terminology, what I said this morning for, for, for basically everyone, it's, it, it will be good to have something to, to build on to start with. Yes, I, uh, we, are, we are trying to kind of be tidy and um, let me see this thing. Uh, we're trying to be tidy and we've been putting also some, uh, for example, the names of the global uh, land cover and biomes and things. So we now put it in like just Google Sheet and then you have all these legends, for example, and you have the colors and things. And um, so we, we, we just started doing this. And when I imported everything, uh, let me see. So at the moment, I have something like 30 tables. So there's the global impact pressure, global change, um, uh, uh, SACCI legend, SACLC legend, Louisa legend. 
So, so there's a lot of things we're now just putting and organizing, and eventually we can add it in open land map. So it just loads. You have a code and you load all this. Uh, no, but uh, but at least at least we have. I will put. I will uh, at least there will be this uh, git book. Uh, let me see where's the git book. Um, so the uh, this one. At least there will be this thing, and so uh, people it will be human readable. So if you go to some uh, file naming or, or some codes, it will be all listed, so you can really uh, find it. Um, so that's that's the best we can do for now, and then we will put these tables. We will uh, make them available in the Python package. So you just have a code and you load it, and it's always you know it's in a package. It's registered, and you say, "I'm using the package version this, and this is the legend that was there, right?" I know in GRC they have this uh, uh, registry of all these terms, and I know they use it. There's even a software they made. Uh, to register these ontologies, yeah. So I know, I know. But we tried installing it actually, and it was not easy. It's not easy. So um, absolutely, I want. I, you know, we are ready to register things and keep it tidy. Just the question: What's the tool? You know, how to do it? Now, as I said, we just use for practical purposes just Google Sheet, and you put all these things, and at least it's always uh, uh, backed up and covered. Uh, but just to complete. Uh, so you saw the open land map. It's not, it's not uh, finished, but uh, I think we have a good design uh, doing the, everything with Cox and Cloud Optimize and Flat GeoBuff and GeoParquet. Uh, and um, we will now be putting a lot of data. We've been like waiting for this. And now in about one month, we will finish the, this is the version two of the open land map. Uh, so it will have this uh, slider and comparison. It will be all Cox based. And, um, and we will have also 3D view, so you can also watch um, from the cesium. You can see with the relief. I mean, if I go to Alps, maybe somewhere here. So it will be also like a really virtual earth. And, uh, and so soon we'll finish that and then we'll make this uh, uh, book. Um, and then we will say, okay, now if you, want, if you want to improve, you know, this is how you improve when you do things. And we will put it on many stuff we'll put on SSD. So it will be fast. It will be super fast, actually. Some things we saw we can make even faster than in Google Maps. Um, so we will make it super fast. And then uh, hopefully from next, from next year, it will be ready if you're making global data. And if you want to host it, of course, we are not against that you put it on uh, Microsoft Planter computer. Google Earth Engine, uh, we don't mind, but if you want, you can also host it here. There will be API, it will be way more simple. And uh, anybody using it, there's no plan that people use it. And like in, when you use Google, of course, there's a plan that you start using other Google Cloud services and you start paying, you become a customer. Here, there's no customer system. This is not for profit system. We don't want to uh, have a system. Then also the X cube. Also very interesting to us, we are, uh, once we make this open land map, we will see to get uh, Xcube also works with Cox. So we have these legends, we have the styling, everything, and we will try to make in a code the Xcube version of the open land map. So it will also, should also work smoothly, but we haven't tested it. Uh, and then finally, I just want to say, uh, we are also looking at this uh, solution called um, G3W suite, it's made in Italy, by the way. It's like a um, web version of QGS. So you can, and uh, Murat, Murat actually here with us, what he made, uh, he made the time slider. So this is real magic now. So you can have the data can be anywhere. It can be distributed. You just need this address of the cork and you set up an interface where you can also show time changes and whatever. Uh, and it will be, you can install it on your own machine or your own server, and you have the whole WebGIS functionality out of box, right? So that's the WebGIS out of box. Uh, it's called G3W uh, suite. And uh, Murat made an extra little package just to have that time slider because it didn't exist. But there's other people developing other toolboxes, so you can also combine it. So you could go, theoretically speaking, this is the tier three, by the way, in OpenNet Monitor. So theoretically speaking, if you have this installed somewhere, 
the G3W suite, which is out of box, so it's like a, a WebGS version of QGS. Um, theoretically speaking, you could set up something like Open Land Map in one afternoon, right? If you just want to have a one layer, uh, you could set up the points, the layers, the background layers in one afternoon, and off you go. You have your own WebGS, right? So that's also something you want to support. And the data, you don't have to even upload the data. You just put the address where the data is somewhere in the world, right? And you combine the data and you create an interface and you create a little app. So that's also something uh, possible coming up. Uh, and that's, uh, that's what I wanted to talk about. So uh, I think I'm a bit over time, but uh, thank you so much for the listening. And um, help us with the file naming convention, please. And consider if you're making global data, especially in open at monitor, if you're making global data, we can integrate it so it will be visible. People can just open and look at it. Um, and also we will make a catalog so it will be also possible to um, see this data in a catalog in stack and also catalog for point data. So it will be possible to uh, get your data inside. Thank you.